Yeah. A little with robots, but you get you get the idea. Yes. One, one thing I would. Say, a great idea. One of the things we I, maybe David already mentioned this is these services that he's he's created here mm -hmm. are actually reusable, so you can attach them to any of the robots that you see here. So yep. uh, that's you know that's a great part of what we're doing here is the reusability of of the code. Mm -hmm. This is this is something that most people in the robotics community don't have right now. They let alone have solutions. Being able to apply, re reapply the same bits of code over and over again to a variety of different platforms is something that most of them have already told us that we've disclosed this to, that it's very exciting for them to be able to have that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me show very you some, cool. uh, some different types of robots, too. And again, we're a little bit hardware constrained, but we're doing our best. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, here's some more people in the team. Okay. Hey, I'm going to try some of Dev, right on. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a developer. Nice to meet you. So what are we looking at here? So here we have a Condo KHR1 humanoid robot. Uh, of course. There are, this is one of three or four available on the market, made typically by servo manufacturers. Um, and he's a set, essentially a set of 17 servos and two servo control boards and we can set the position of each of the servos and make them do some cool stuff. Excellent. So on screen you can see I have a service that has an entry for each servo. Okay. And I can tweak these individually. I'll give you an example. These aren't labeled, but I happen to know that servo number six on board zero is, the, is his head. So if you watch his head, <laughs> and you can see we're just using IE. You just bring up heat. I mean, Paul came up with all these beautiful XLTs you're seeing. It just transforms the state. All we're doing is we're doing a, a get on the state of this robot service. Mm -hmm. It transforms it, gives a little way to both read and write data. And then mm -hmm. the web browser is your tool. This is what you use to interact. And then, of course, you also have code that can asynchronously interact with each other, use the CCR, use no, DSS, and do high level of orchestrations. And we can show you that a little bit later. But so it can walk, turn its head, move its arms. Exactly. You know, yeah. so another service, yell out. Another service could tell it to assume a certain position or to perform a sequence of actions or program a sequence of actions into it. So we don't have those services yet, but it's very Now you cool. can start building abstractions. And, and the important thing about our model is we, we don't necessarily do inheritance. We don't have these complicated models that are the traditional object models that this derives from this and if you're a sensor then you can be like uh, you know a laser range finder and all that it's more like a composition sometimes you'll be used as a sensor sometimes you'll be a more higher level thing and uh, it's more of this mashup as actually people are saying of things that you stitch together and you're creating applications okay. and, and you're just seeing that it's really based on state it, any behavior that we have is triggered by state changes we don't have arbitrary events saying light is on or are moved. Literally. So let's talk about that though for a second. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's important. What you're saying is this is not an event-driven model. It actually you saying, is that what you it, it is an event-driven model, but it's not um, unbound or or generic event-driven model. It's really just tied to state. Just okay. think of having, and state can be anything. I mean, uh, earlier we show you the laser range finder had a JPEG, okay. and this is the REST model. I mean, you just basically say you can represent yourself whichever way you want, but we do structured stuff. So you can say, I have a portion of my state that changed. Mm -hmm. The event can only be that this portion of the state changed. Mm -hmm. Not just some name that you throw up. You see yeah, what I'm saying? You this bind way, the so object. It's, it's, yeah. It's a okay. so it's a, you can think of it as, if you know RSS for doing websites when they update, this is a fine-grained version of that. Where okay. you don't have to pull for the document. When it changes, it will actually send you a little notification that now I have changed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what you see here on the, on the screen is a very good representation of state. You see a set of properties. And that's what you can think of when you see when you see this guy, there's he really one. has a set of properties. His, his, he has his legs, his hands and his uh, head. And you can say the properties are really what position are they in? Are they moving? Are they doing anything? And if they're not doing anything, they just there. They don't change. But if mm -hmm. they move, they start changing values. And now other services 
can observe those values, in fact, get notified, mm -hmm. so they can start comp composed with each other. That's a very simple model based on this state paradigm that we keep bringing up all the time. And it turns out to be, it fits robotics very nicely, simply because lots of the things we want to describe have these properties. Is the motor on? Mm -hmm. Is the arm waving? Whatever mm -hmm. is happening? And all that we can do very nicely through this model. And of course it matches in very, it's, it is, as, as George also has been saying, very close to the web model. So we can use existing web infrastructure. Even RSS and whatnot and XML and XSLT, all of it just works with what we do because we're just accessible through HTTP. Excellent. So here's what was behind cool. it to really get an idea of what we mean by state. Okay. These are the server positions right now that you're seeing. And what Paul was doing, he was just transforming them within IE to give you a little bit friendlier UI. Okay. But underneath, if I want to debug something quickly, people bring up their service, it's up and running, it's like 10 lines of code to bring this up, it's already bound to HTTP, you don't have to worry about all that. And then you can debug it, you do a get on IE, mm, I see what it's doing. Excellent. No, the you know, consequence some. of this is also that you can put the computation where you want, because on this guy, obviously, you don't have a lot of stuff running on it, so you have to run a lot of it on your PC, mm -hmm. but on the Pioneer that you saw, the very first, the big ones with a wheel on it, yes. it actually runs a PC. It is a PC on wheels. Uh -huh. So it runs complete all our stuff as as is. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of put things where it makes sense. Okay. You can even have multiple robots talking to each other and create swarms. And it all just hooks up naturally over the network. Excellent. So Very cool. So another thing. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you. And we'll probably keep talking to you, but we're moving down this way now. So Andreas can describe, uh, he did a higher order functionality, which is common in robotics where you orchestrate, and you have some more complicated state machines. And again, you use the CCR to manage those state transitions. Okay. And you can talk a little bit about the logic that you put in. So what we have here is uh, one of those off-the-shelf robots, which runs a set of our services. Uh, uh -huh. Base-level services that do like the, ba the basic stuff that you need talks to D. Uh, controller board that sits on the robot, which is the motor on and off, and reports the state of the controller back. So how fast my wheels are turning, what does the laser see? Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, for the robot, a couple of services sitting on there. So there's a service for the drive system that moves it forwards and backwards. Mm -hmm. And that service actually speaks the same contract that the little Lego thing uh, mm -hmm. has. So we can, we can use the same orchestration to drive the little Lego thing to the big thing. And then we'll nice. show you in simulation. Uh -huh. in a very realistic physics simulation using the same services that David showed you. Mm -hmm. We can apply them and drive this stuff, we can apply them and interact with the Lego stuff and also with the simulation stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of reuse going on, mostly because the structure of you know, the document or the, or the robot is very similar. Cool. Now, when you, you first learned about and started working with the CCR in this project, right? So, yes. So how, how, how was your, what was your impression when you first encountered it? So programmatically. Programmatically, so what did you it, think of it? it? It was a very great offering. I, I loved it the first instance I saw it. Uh, mm -hmm. It is when you are involved with writing distributed systems and, and systems that are uh, inherently par parallel, like robots are. Mm -hmm. The CCR is really the only pattern that, that matches that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's just a great experience of, of uh, writing applications uh, for this. Nice, cool. nice example is this. Uh, What's going on here? Just spinning so, 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 wheels. So, huh? so we have the basic services that I just described, but we also have a service that subscribes to all the basic services. Mm -hmm. Now it takes the state of those basic services, measures them up, me measures them up, makes a decision about what it sees. So we have the laser range finder here, which which gets me a sta scan of my environment. Okay. Now you're standing in front of it. Okay. Which so is it why knows it, that. Yeah, which is why it's turning it's slowly. Down, yeah. ah. when, you, when you go back, it would, would move. So we're going to let it loose now, and you'll Parts see how it. it'll avoid you and all that. And, um, okay, bye-bye. So now, step in front of me. Go ahead. So now it tries, to find, right. it tries to find a new way based on what it sees. Very cool. And now it's found it, and we can actually let it out. <laughs> it won't. It's afraid of me. It's afraid. It's afraid. It's <laughs> shy. Let it out. <laughs> we should bring the simple da David, can you connect to this system with a simple dashboard? Let me talk to you. We have a problem oh, here. Yeah, step down. When we do let it out, it has a tendency just to go and wander <laughs> off. And yeah. people yeah. in the building want to know who it is. And, yeah, and it's trying to find it. Trap itself. it. Um, yeah, gets it, it gets boxed in and shut in people's offices. This is what researchers do, for, apparently. Well, that's fine.
So do you think there's any implications for the use of this platform for developing sort of intelligence in a robot? Like, could you utilize, because thinking requires several parallel processes, obviously. Well, what we try to do here is to put the basics in place so that you don't have to start doing the basics of sending messages and building applications and all that kind of stuff for you. Mm -hmm. We would love, and we, we actually work with researchers to try and come up with very high level abstractions for doing AI and whatnot. That's always difficult, yeah. and we're not trying to say we solve that. Of course. But what we do is provide an infrastructure that enables people to play with this in a serious way so that they can build these high-level functions on that. And you're mm -hmm. about to be, well, he's wandering off. Yeah, he touched my and foot so and then moved back. It's an enabling factor in that regard. Sure. And what we would like to do is to collaborate with as many researchers as we can to build a community and to build reuse and to enable this through our platform here so that we can get... Um, community going, we can get benefits of people starting playing with it and build bigger and more, more apps. We're just in the beginning here. Absolutely. This is obviously just the very early on and we would like to see very complicated robots um, and I'm sure they will evolve. Absolutely. Um, our model also maps fairly closely to models that people are using in learning network systems. Mm. So there is a natural progression I think as people get used to this where we, sure. we may start to see those kinds of systems using this and it's a natural it's a natural mix because the robot work exists in an unpredictable environment so learning systems fit that pretty well. Fantastic. But wait, there's more. There's more, of course there is. So do you wanna we can show you the live view of the laser. I don't know how we're doing our time. We have about twenty three minutes left of film. Okay. So um so this guy is an autonomous mapping now. He's using the, the laser data and the bumping data and all that to make it... So it stop. Yeah. Trying to find another way around. Calculating. How can I get away from that guy? How can I get yeah. away from George? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's George very boy. common. Nice this, job, we're, sh buddy. we're showing this application because we want to show people that more interesting orchestration with a lot of state transitions. If you try to do it with threads mm -hmm. and locking and all that, it really gets... Yeah. Very messy soon. Well, could you imagine if the threads start locking and or, well, you know, you have, I mean, it's, it's uh, the threads, and the other thing is <laughs> failure, right? I mean, it's, it's things now it's combinatorial explosion of the failure cases. Mm -hmm. So you really want to have a couple of lines saying, do this, do this, do this, and if they all succeed, do this, or if anything fails, do that. Try doing that with a synchronous programming pattern, or doing it with events. You're yeah. gonna write a lot of code again and again, and you're gonna get it wrong. Totally. Um, so that's the stuff that we're trying to do, and it's just a, a perfect fit for this. It's fantastic. I mean, what you're doing basically is eliminating the, not eliminating, but really reducing potential for writing bugs into your robots. <coughs> yes, absolutely. We're writing so. new bugs into our robots. But yeah, but, they're, they're, <laughs> <laughs> but they work well asynchronously. Great. The point, <laughs> the point that you always have to, to understand, I think software is the same thing. It's really that we're not running out of CPU power. Mm -hmm. We don't need concurrency so much for that. We need it for responsiveness. Sure. People are writing applications that are not responsive because they're afraid to touch the file and also read something from the server because then the failure cases explode. Sure. And, and our model kind of helps you with that, both the DSS model and the CCR model. Absolutely. And it just goes from there. And robots, I think, it's just are going to make it clear that things are loosely coupled Excellent. and things go wrong. So we do actually a lot more advanced stuff when it comes to failure handling. We have this, this concept of causality, so you have this logical flow. It's mm -hmm. kind of similar to transactions, it's just it's not very heavy weight because it doesn't give you the same guarantees. Okay. But you can do things like, if I send a request to this robot, but this robot, mm -hmm. without me knowing, sends 10 other requests mm -hmm. that now, in a tree-like fashion, propagate through its system, mm -hmm. and anything goes wrong, we can have a single handler that basically takes care of that. Think of it as a generalized, a generalization over the tri cats but over many machines and many processors. Nice. Which is a really sweet way to debug. Absolutely. It's like a, it's, it poisons the system with this flow, essentially, and then anything goes wrong, you can go back to one place and start handling it. Outstanding. So, so that really helps. But wait, there's more. Well, but of course. So now what do we have? So an, another thing that we believed uh, very strongly about, and because we're Microsoft, we, don't, we want to turn a hardware problem into a software problem. <laughs> Not that software is easy or anything, mm -hmm. but the thing we've been working on is we, we partnered with a GIA that does a, a really high-end, a very nice uh, physics engine. Okay. And this physics engine has been used in games, of course, but we recognized early on that, that uh, games share a lot of things with robotics. 
Mm -hmm. And one of the things they do is they have, essentially they model things in the game environment as actors or as bots or as robots. They have sensory interfaces. They, have, they use physics to give you this realism and constrain things just like they would in the real world. And of course they have really nice rendering. All that to, to immerse you. Now it turns out that robotics needs a lot of that if you want a prototype. A lot of this hardware is actually expensive. It's actually rare. Okay. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this, this changes, but right now you, you're probably going to have a laptop or you're just going to have your PC, but you want to do robotics, right? Mm -hmm. So having a really good simulator, something that allows you very easily to go in and with a couple of lines of code have entities, and we have tutorials, by the way, on our website that will show this, that you can add things to the world, but it's not a toy. It doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. You can do extremely advanced stuff. You can have thousands of objects. You can have very complicated friction models. You can have very complicated joint models. You can have all that stuff. And we mm -hmm. actually have this running, and it's, it's available. Fantastic. Not only we have it running, but we're actually using the same services to create our robots and interact with them without rewriting those services. It's basically a, an enormous amount of reuse, and it's already distributed. I'm running my simulation, you can participate. You can come and join in Absolutely. and drop entities. So you can imagine community building where, where some people focus on the 3D models. Mm -hmm. Let me show you something. Uh, we had an intern, Diego, that, that did a really good job creating models in Maya or your favorite CAD program. So you've seen the pioneers, right? I mean, look at this one in our simulated environment. It's a pretty nice model of the, of the robot. Absolutely. And you do this in Maya or whatever. And we also did a model it has like 170,000 polygons, a little bit overkill, but, you know, the Lego mm -hmm. that you saw. So this is a visualization of our simulator. We don't have, we just have a few objects just to test. This is basically a test. Mm -hmm. um, this is another thing that sits with the DirectX SDK, and it's just a mess, but we show you in the physics world mm. how everything is modeled. So basically, in physics, you have some very simple, oh, our buddy here is... is trying to figure out what to do. He wants to learn about the physics he, stuff. He actually always come by. If you notice, there's these papers right under oh, the danger of robotics. Whoa. Okay. So the laser didn't pick up the uh, ooh, a little bit. Sorry about shaking out there, everybody. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> um, look, the arm died. <laughs> <laughs> this is way too skinny for, for the laser to see. <laughs> <laughs> This really is a danger around So what is it, just a scanning laser that's just scanning around? or? So what this laser is, it's basically a plane, and you're, you're emitting, it has a, a rotating mirror, uh -huh. and it has an infrared, it's an infrared laser, and um, it gives you distance measurements. And okay. that's what you show the cylindrical projections with distance measurements. Uh -huh. But because it's a plane, anything under it and above it, it won't see. Now in the DARPA challenges, what people did is they took multiple of these and oriented them vertically or horizontally uh -huh. so they can create a more complete view of their environment. Sure. Here we just have one and it actually is very expensive. So one mm -hmm. of the things we're going to be working on is vision um, slam, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. So just using a webcam, okay. you can now start replacing lasers and starting to doing this type of detection. So we're going to be coupling together, and we're working with research and, and, and other people outside that sure. are going to be using vision to make robotics affordable. Outstanding, because if you use sonar, you're saying it wouldn't be. So sonar has issues. Laser, a lot of people use laser because it's just a much more accurate thing and you get better precision. Okay. Uh, sonar is just very noisy and it's, it's, not, it's not very well understood yet how you can do this mapping using just sonar. Okay. So using vision or using laser, we think we have we can have a pretty good way of getting stuff being autonomous. Outstanding. Now, 